Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Elizabeth Carter, the email marketing manager here at Charity Digital, and I'm going to be your host for today's session. And I just would like to give you all a very, very warm welcome today. Today's session is on best practices in cybersecurity, and it's going to be delivered by Paul Fenwick from Advance. And last, Lance Nesbitt is also here to help answer your questions. Um, before handing you over to today's speaker, I just want to share a few house rules, exciting updates and pointers for today's session. Firstly, I'm excited to let you know about Charities Digital's new single sign-in function, um, if you haven't already experienced this. Um, we currently have two separate websites to deliver our services. The website, um, the, the website that's dedicated to our content, uh, which is where you would have registered for today's webinar, and our Charity Digital Exchange, our transactional website dedicated to product purchases, discounts, and validation services. Registering for both websites is completely free, and you can now exchange the, or access, you can now access the Exchange website with your original Charity Digital log, login credentials. You can contact us via email, phone, or live chat if you have any questions or queries on this. Now, let's move on to today's session. It's going to be recorded and it will be uploaded to watch on demand within a week's time. The slides and other resources will also be made available to you by the end of the day. Closed captions are available, available and we will share in the chat how to enable these. During the webinar, please feel free to ask lots of questions in the chat for Lance and Paul and to uh, they will address these questions at the end of the presentation. And also please feel free to share any other comments, experiences, or your top tips in the chat section too. Finally, if you do have any sound or image issues, please let us know in the chat and uh, we'll jump on and we'll do our very best. We've got um, Chiara in the back end and she will get the session back to normal as soon as she can. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul and Lance. A very warm welcome to you. Hi there. Good afternoon all. Not sure if Lance is there. Uh, but uh, yeah, so hopefully um, this session this afternoon um, that we've tailored toward He's probably looking at the smaller charities, um, but does apply to kind of everyone uh, will be useful. So what I'll do is I'll just get started so that we can uh, go through this. As mentioned, happy to answer any questions that you've got. Um, just put them in the chat and we'll deal with them at the end of the slide deck, which I will be making available. So, so. What I thought I'd do is kind of give a bit of a background. So as we can see here, um, why cyber attacks would look at charities. They are the same as any other business uh, and do have kind of monetary value. Uh, as you can see here, with an income of 100 billion, they are going to target anyone and everything. Um, so this is kind of a report um, which shows that information, some really useful information there from the NCSC, which if people are not aware of, the NCSC is the National Cyber Security Centre, um, created by the government in association with um, GCHQ to provide um, businesses and charities and everyone with impartial cyber security advice. Recommend there. Unfortunately, what it showed is that 30% of charities have identified a cyber attack within the last 12 months. Not surprisingly, really, uh, given the scale of cyber as we see it, cyber attacks, malicious in various ways, shapes and forms. Uh, and unfortunately, 19% of those attacks did have really bad outcomes. As you can see here, we're seeing this, the average cyber attack, a cost of about 4,000 pounds. 
that can escalate very quickly if they decide to use ransomware. They certainly have um, higher uh, value. But even then, um, that whilst it seems may seem a small amount of money for any charity, it is uh, impactful uh, and has disastrous consequences um, to all kind of everyone involved within that. And why would they target a charity sector as opposed to business? Well, quite a few. Um, unfortunately, I suppose charities don't have the um, funds that um, large businesses would to spend on IT and infrastructure. They probably won't have uh, a dedicated IT person um, the you know their sole purpose is to make sure that everything is done kind of uh, you know to the best of their ability, uh, making sure they follow all protocols etc. They just don't have that. Often it's maybe one of the person that's doing multiple jobs within the charity, um, and IT is just one of those jobs uh, that they have to do. So that's probably one of the biggest things is yeah uh, not having the funds or the resources available to do that. Another tricky one comes in that because of that um, sort of again monetary factor is a number of charities are using bring your own device. Now that makes it very tricky when you're trying to kind of apply uh, security and so forth to that and procedures because you're actually dealing with somebody who may be using that laptop or tablet or whatever for their own purpose. Um, Typically in business, you would kind of try to keep all that business information on that equipment and safeguard that. But uh, so that kind of conflict of interest um, does make things a little more difficult in regards to the equipment and why they're maybe not as secure. Uh, another one is probably the high volume of staff. Uh, and some of these people, or quite a few of them, tend to work part time. So they're only in the charity, you know, perhaps a day or two each week. So, you know, they're not getting used to the kind of um, the training, maybe, or the systems. They find it, you know, less uh, difficulty. So that's kind of some of the kind of main areas that are probably certainly for a charity as opposed to uh, business that would um, kind of make them a target for cyber criminals. And from what we see, so as uh, an employee of Avast, which is part of the Gen Digital uh, now company, um, we see cyber threats rising constantly. And as you can see, we're, we're now at the highest point we've ever been. Um, you can see from our devices there that it's up 13% quarter on quarter so there's just more and more and it's just seems to be never ending we do three see the threat landscape changing um we've kind of whilst we still see you know ransomware and so forth what we're seeing more is kind of scams and phishing these are our kind of easier uh by these criminals to be able to kind of leverage they're able to easily buy kind of tools uh, and everything that they need very cheaply through the dark web uh, to aid them in that and so it's less sophisticated and that way they can actually do it so we've seen a huge increase in scams now you know a lot of these scams and so forth come in very different ways um I suppose the main ones people will see are um, phishing. So they will send typically an email into the charity uh, demanding a payment or something. Now, they could pretend to be from a financial one, so say offering uh, grants and so forth. But what to do is kind of call to action within those emails to be aware of. You know, we need this payment now. Thing, but we, they're very demanding and that's where you've kind of got to spot and so forth uh, and recognize that this may be false um so um 
so that's um what we see certainly more of that also it's fishing uh taking into account spear fishing so with everyone's kind of social media uh presence available out there it doesn't take too much effort to um, find out more information about the person they're looking to target so they understand their kind of role and responsibility what the charity does and they can then target that in the email that they're going to send so that's kind of some of the reports and ways that we are seeing them targeting charities so lots of information if you do wish to kind of get more information from us on sort of the threats that we see uh, and some helpful advice there is the decoded.vastio website uh, which goes through them. So if you're interested in know how specific threats are kind of being created uh, and how they work, you can cover that information there. So the big question today is where do we start? So there's a lot of kind of, I suppose, information online. Who do we trust? Who do we not? And say, I would, and I've recommended going through the NCSC uh, government. It's impartial, we're not kind of restricting, we're just giving you some clear advice uh, that's kind of there. So the first thing would be identify and back up your data. What is important to the charity? Where is it located? Chances are you don't need to back up everything. Um, it's probably just a few spreadsheets, a few you know important documents and so forth. You probably, although they may seem of value to you, some kind of photographs and so forth, but they may be useful. Um, and so identify and then make a backup of those. Now, that could be a USB device if we were to kind of uh, really simplify it. But the main thing would be not just making it onto USB and leaving that on the device itself. What you've got to think of in case of a disaster how would I be able to kind of get that information back again? If it's on a USB, take the USB and put it somewhere else or, or in a different location. Or consider using something like a cloud backup where it's taking it to a completely different area. That way, in case there was, you know, fire flood or any other damage, um, you can retrieve that. You've also got the rest of hardware failures and so forth as well. That will also cover you against ransomware. So typically ransomware will encrypt your data on the device. And the only way other than paying the extravagant extortion fees uh, and ransom is to return it from the backup. So what you should do is really try and have a look at this and make backup a part of your everyday procedures. You know, can I get back to where I need to be if anything were to happen to those files today, tomorrow? The next, I suppose, is um, self-explanatory and coming from a, a an AV type vendor is just ensuring that it's on all the devices that you use. Would that even be mobile as well? Uh, people tend to think that things like Mac operating systems and mobiles are not as affected by these, but they are all targeted. Um, we have examples of uh, viruses and threats that work on those. So make sure that you've got that working on all um, and up to date. So make sure it is a valid subscription as well. Sometimes people uh, believe that when they buy a new piece of uh, hardware, that it comes with um, a your antivirus running on it. What often happens is they're time limited. So you may be getting, you know, a certain product on there for 60, 90 days. But after that, it's no longer working. So make sure that's in there. And also be careful about what you actually download and install, particularly with um, apps and so forth as well. Uh, so when going through the Play or uh, Google Store um, for any Apple apps and stuff you have, um, check the validity of them. Uh, 
there's often a reason um, that software is being given out free is because they're going to actually try and get information and data off you. Um, so be careful on that with um, that sort of free software. The next thing is probably making sure that everything is kept up to date, all your software. For the most part, operating systems on uh, you know, desktops and mobiles will keep themselves up to date, automatic updates and so forth. But it's making sure that that is actually happening. Um, and that's where, you know, having a patch management solution or something like that, where you can see that information centrally may help. Um, but making sure everything's up to date and not just the actual operating systems itself. All the other software needs to be kept up to date as well. After all, software is coded by humans. We make mistakes uh, and we can leave a vulnerability uh, within software. And what often happens is, you know, we will then address that vulnerability. But in doing so, when the vendor actually says we've released an update to prevent you know, anyone allowing malicious code through. They're also giving an indication to the cyber criminals that if they manage to find that software without the vulnerability patch, where they can go. Lastly, passwords. I know it can be a bane for everyone trying to remember passwords. Um, I suppose good practice would be to make sure that you have a different password for each service or systems you use, so you're not replicating. Um, the Avast hack check, which is available online, will let you know if there's been any compromise on your email or password. So it's worth that. Make sure you have a pin or so forth on um, and use complex passwords for devices. Preferably, turn on two-factor authentication. So such as most people are aware of when they use their banking apps and so forth, how you either send you a code or you have to uh, get text, etc. cetera. Um, it's there. So yeah, exactly as Simon's just put in the, uh, the thing there, that have I been pre WN is similar to what we are offering. Uh, it can be quite frightening when you see just how much has been compromised. And make sure you change any default passwords that come with equipment. Um, that can also be used. You may also want to consider password manager. So if the stronger making that, it is very difficult to keep track of it all. So why not put into a password manager and so forth there. Yeah. So I just wanted to put this up. This is um, the National and Cyber Security Centre advice here for small charities, but I believe it applies to us all, um, regardless of kind of the size. And this is just what they're kind of saying. Is make sure you're backing up, prevent that, updating that you can see here. Um, if you are going to use USBs, make sure you're kind of there checked and scanned for viruses and so forth. So a lot of the kind of content and stuff that we're talking about here uh, is on this infographic they prefer. So I would, you know, as it mentions here about even passwords, try to avoid things uh, such as, you know, pets' names and so forth. I know it's very easy to kind of use. However, through social media, things like Facebook, they can probably guess what your password is from posts that you've done. So that's a very useful place to kind of start is by going there. Of course, um, to help with that, product-wise and so forth, then we have um, some of our solutions. So we have our antivirus. So this is probably more comprehensive than what uh, people would see as a sort of free software. Um, this one contains much more um, shields uh, and security measures. Um, so it's preventing you from malicious uh, scripts uh, being sent when you visit websites uh, or malicious websites will block you straight away. 
file shield. So anytime you're scanning or opening files, they're checked. They're checked against the database, which we update 200 times a day with the latest uh, threats that we see. Email, so if you've got an email uh, client on your device, we will integrate into that to scan incoming and outgoing mail. Uh, we've also got a behavior shield. So as it says there, it actively analyzes suspicious activity. So in other words, what it's doing is it's not looking for a specific threat like the file shields do. It's monitoring activity. So we know if things are, how they react, if it suddenly starts to download things, change file names, um, et cetera. We know that kind of behavior leads to kind of uh, malicious threats. Um, so those zero day threats that we don't know about. So that's where we protect that. And there's lots of others. It also include, that also includes um, secure line VPN which is very useful if you kind of use that device and connect on to um, different Wi-Fi's, um, coffee shops and various other things. We've got the patch management. So the difference with that is because it's uh, with the Avast business here, you will have the ability to centrally see for your sort of Windows devices and so forth, what is the status of all those devices? What are they missing patch-wise? So it would run a scan once a day just to kind of go through all of that and say, right, you're missing so-and-so updates. These are particularly important ones and critical ones for not just Windows and so forth, but for all the other software that we use nowadays, which will be Acrobat PDF uh, readers and writers. Uh, we've got Zoom meetings and stuff like we're on there now lots of other kind of pieces of software and making sure that they are up to date and that we can report on these and make sure that we can actually say prove that if we are going to kind of get uh, compliance so that's another thing that often people are looking to make sure that they implement these uh, products and procedures in place for is for compliance um, things such as the cyber essentials that people may be aware of, uh, they require you to have these sort of things. Uh, Cyber Essentials state that you must um, install any security vulnerability for software within 14 days, which, as you can imagine, um, is quite tricky um, when you've got a number of devices, especially as that grows, being able to kind of make sure everything's done within two weeks is very tricky. So... So that's kind of what's certainly available here. There's also content filtering to help protect if you want to ensure that people don't go to certain areas, which for certain charities is very useful. You need to make sure that you restrict access on devices so they don't go to um, gambling uh, sites. It could also be to self-harm as well as kind of obviously other uh, parts of the internet that can be categorized. So that's kind of what we offer through Charity Digital. And also what we have is lots of other stuff from our website. So we've put together a cybersecurity training quiz. So to identify, and it's worth doing, going through and saying, you know, just how are things for your particular charity at the moment? Take our kind of quiz and have a look at the training there where we can say, yes, you know, asking all those questions about, like I've kind of put, um, are you using strong passwords? Um, how do you kind of make sure devices are up to date? Um, how often do you carry a training of staff? And so forth, such as that. The next link is our Avast Academy. So as with a lot of the cybersecurity, uh, trying to kind of find out what everything means. But So what am I meaning by a VPN? You know, what does a VPN do? Um, what is, you know, the backup? Um, what is uh, patching? Or what is a ransomware? If you need to know, uh, go here and it can be explained. So you could kind of use this as part of your uh, cyber or IT training for staff, just so that they kind of are aware of that. 
as I mentioned earlier in the, the deck, we've got this decoded.avast.io, which gives you information that our Threat Labs team, who get all that information from all the threats that we see globally, um, to, to go to so that they have um, information on that. And the last one is that hack check um, that I mentioned where you can type in your emails and see if it's been compromised, which could have been through some of the past ones through people like BA and so forth like that, who um, let uh, credentials out there, breaches. I'm sure you've, you've known a number of them, holiday ends and various other um, ones. So you'll be able to see have your email been compromised. If that is the case, then that's where we would recommend that you look at that partnership of your email address password being changed. And this also then kind of in turn goes back to what I mentioned about using different passwords and so forth for different services and so forth. So I wanted to kind of keep it um, fairly short and concise because I'd rather kind of turn it over to questions because I think that's often more useful for people to kind of ask questions on what pertains to them uh, in regards to cyber security. So I can see there's been some good activity in the chat. So there has. Thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate that. And uh, it's over to you two now for the questions and Lance. We <laughs> have had um, quite a lot of activity in the chat. I was actually really surprised. 200 times a day you check. That's That was an amazing um, statistic for me. Yes, anyway. yes. So it just shows how many <laughs> threats are out there. Yeah, it's... Oh, yeah. Um, yes, that is. So let's let's move over to the questions because they're rolling in. Um, we had a question in the chat from John Burton, which was answered by Lance. And he asked, um, bring your own device, is this mitigated? If we have staff just using their own device to connect to their work PC through a VPN. And Lance answered that. I um, don't know whether you want to just say your answer, Lance, and you may want to expand on it as well. Um, sorry, I mean, um... Find the question. Well, I think you mentioned there that you're connecting into a work computer. So, yes, that is a good method of keeping it, um, whether it be virtual device, as some people have. They have virtual work devices that they connect to uh, to keep everything there, or it's a device that they keep on premise within the charity uh, location, and then they access from home. Um, through a remote. Now, the VPN is um, probably more uh, to do with the connection. VPN is a great security tool. So VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And what it means is that it's actually uh, encrypting the communication from your device through the internet. So it makes sure that nobody else can access it. Uh, that's why we recommend it if you're using it on unknown Wi-Fi. But probably the main important thing is if you are accessing another device, using something like remote control, log me in and so forth like that, is checking uh, and restricting the access to that um, to make sure, because as you open something like Windows Remote Desktop, in effect, if somebody manages to know what you're external facing IP addresses, they can try to connect to it. So it doesn't mitigate everything um, from a, a sort of point of view of when you're actually carrying out the work, then yes, it will be safer because you're on a dedicated work device rather than a bring your own. But there are kind of more things to look at since you are kind of connecting to another device, making sure you're not opening up to anybody else to be able to connect to your work computer. Okay, brilliant. That That's um, a very concise um, answer to that. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question from Rachel, Rachel Barnsley, who is asking, is there any antivirus software to use with Chromebooks? Most software says it doesn't run on Chrome OS. Yes, um, we have come across that. We know that ourselves. Um, 
we did have some that used to work because it's based on the sort of Android. However, that's kind of evolved and changed. We don't. It's something that we're working on at present. I know there's a number. I don't have any uh, off the top of my head that do work with Chromebooks, but yeah, I do sympathise. Um, the only thing, I suppose, positive to take from that at the moment is they are still quite low in regards to targeting. Uh, certainly the higher ones tend to be kind of the the Windows uh, and Mac operating systems as well as some of the Android devices. But it is something we are trying to develop um, and it's convincing that we want it for Chromebooks. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, we've got another question from Laurie Sharp who is asking, are there free trials available on your software products? Um, I guess, can I just tie this in with another question as well that I had direct about, can you use free advance, uh, advanced so or or other antivirus? So I wonder whether you can just have a stab yeah, at sure. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so there is a big thing. I mean, people say, oh, but Avast, give out free antivirus. We do that for the greater good. We want everybody to kind of be protected digitally. So that's why we give it out. But what we are doing is we're giving that out to home users, so to you personally. If you work as part of a charity, it's the same as a business. That kind of contravenes how we are kind of licensing. So you'd actually be breaking our license agreement that you do and agree to when you kind of install the software. So that's one thing with regards to the free antivirus. The second is the free antivirus doesn't have the same capabilities as we do. So it's probably just doing a simple kind of checking for files as there. It doesn't have things like we have, which look to target ransomware, things like that behavior shield that I mentioned, web shield, all these other kind of components, VPN, they're not included in a, a kind of free version. So it's not kind of as strong uh, in its security stance. So that's kind of what I would say is there. As for trials, I believe so, but that's up to Lance. <laughs> We're more, more than happy to give out thirty-day trials on our on our business products, uh, and we and we stand by that. So, if you're not happy with the um, service, then we, we're happy to cancel within that thirty-day period. Okay, there you go. We've got it from Lance. So, and it's recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's move over to another question from Carl Roach. We've tried to restrict site access to some domains, but HTTPS seems to stop being able to do this. Are there alternatives? Oh, that's a very good one. So, yes, it's it's difficult. Um, what I would say is, yes, it's um, a good practice to look at firewalls. So as part of the Avast solution, we allow you to kind of control firewalls, which will allow you to do it through a, a policy uh, centrally. So you can, it will apply to all devices. Um, or if you're, it depends if you're looking at doing that through a hardware device. So um, you often get the, um, the router type firewall device in there. Um, but without kind of looking at specific instances, it's very difficult to tell what kind of is or not but uh, certainly if we've got more information on uh, the difficulties, we can certainly try to help on that. But yeah, firewalls are great in that you're blocking and locking things out. However, unfortunately, if it goes too far, then it starts to inhibit what you need to access. So it's kind of getting that balance right. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, we have another question from Andrew Holmes. Would you recommend ISO 27001 certification for small, medium-sized charities? If you if you can push to get uh, ISO accreditation, that, that's that's fantastic. It's taking you through a lot of the steps that uh, Cyber Essentials is doing uh, in regards to kind of practice. What I would say is, depending on the cost for your charity size. Certainly, I would look at something like um, Cyber Essentials. That may just be more cost effective. For me, it's more about being aware of it 
and getting that rather than kind of uh, depending on the size of your child, the actual um, compliance and documentation, ISO accreditation. Um, it's more getting into making sure you follow practice, you do staff training, you put in all these kind of implementations with regard to kind of updating and AV protection. So I'd probably say cyber essentials is probably the, the first step and then look at ISO if you, if you certainly feel you want it. As we're just on the theme of um, Cyber Essentials, um, Carl has just asked, what is Cyber Essentials? Can you just do it in a nutshell? Yeah, sure. So Cyber Essentials is something that the NCSC um, released. So it's a kind of a certification and accreditation to show that you are basically following good IT cybersecurity practice. So there's certain things you've got to, there's two levels with cyber. There's kind of one that you can just submit, but you, you basically answer the question there. Do you have working AV? Do you do backups? All those sorts of things we covered today. And then that's great. Uh, and then the other one is a bit more in depth when you kind of prove it. Um, but what it's doing is just show that you're following good practice. And what's happening now is because it's kind of getting to a, an accreditation level, often other people you deal with or wish to do business with will make sure or request that you hit that particular level. So that's what you see in the supply chain. You know, if you've gone through the trouble of making sure that your IT is up to cyber, cyber essential standards, you would like to think that other companies and businesses you deal with are following that level of practice. So it's kind of trying to just get a standard um, that everyone is following um, in cybersecurity. I hope that helps. <laughs> that does. That's a really well-rounded answer. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, we've got another question from Stuart, Stuart Foster, and he is asking, is there any recommendation or reason to consider changing email address from time to time every few years and would that reduce spam and phishing risks? I don't think there's so much needs to be with regards to email address. Um, certainly it would, it would stop people that do track uh, that you'll be able to see through there. It's probably just making sure that you potentially would regularly change your email address. Um, unfortunately, we do see, particularly if you use things like Gmail, Hotmail, we get um, email compromise. So that's where they've used your email and password. They'll then go into something like your Hotmail account and then pretend to be you and send to your address list, you know, uh, an email saying, you know, I'm in need of financial help or something else uh, and so forth and take over from there. So yeah, whilst email compromise is not great, I would just probably stick to keeping your long complex password maybe look at two-factor authentication with that rather than changing because people will often maybe not keep up with your your recent uh, email address sorry that's just a move yes that's very true <laughs> <clears throat> that is very very true um a, another question from tracy um, where would I find a password manager, please? Lots of them online. We have it within products and so forth as well. But just have a look at that. It's just something to consider uh, if you are. People are, have a concern of, like, where does that go? And will they then have access to all my services? Make sure you're choosing a reputable password one so look at the vendor look at the product before you agree to use because you are uploading all your information to it most of them will have to completely uh, encrypt the information on theirs at the back end so there's no way to physically read it uh, and use it um, but what we have it but you know there's other vendors and stuff as well it's just check that it's a reputable password manager hmm. and how would you check for that I would probably just look at the vendors uh, and reports and so forth on that. Uh, make sure they are a security vendor and not somebody else. So there'll be a number of us say we've got, we've got ones, but there are obviously other antiviruses out there that have 
password managers. Uh, what we'd like everyone to use a vast if you're using McAfee, mm -hmm. um, Bitdefender, or various that they do have password uh, managers and so forth as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. We have another question from Laurie Sharp, who is asking for a small charity of approximately 12 end users using BYOD. What products would you recommend as a minimum to keep it protected? As a minimum, what I would say product wise at the moment would be probably three things, uh, really. Uh, one would be the antivirus to ensure that you're protected that way. The second would be the patch management to make sure everything's uh, up to date because that's as important. I don't think people realise, but a good example would probably be, I think most people will remember the WannaCry uh, that happened a few years ago, how devastating that was. That was actually because of a an update. It wasn't actually a virus or a threat that's done. So making sure software up to date is really as important. And then the last one would be a cloud backup. So those are probably the three things that I would probably really look at. And again, the backup doesn't need to be cloud, but it's probably easiest to implement. Um, mm -hmm. So that's probably the three things to do. There's lots of other, as you say, uh, security things that you can implement, um, but they're kind of maybe more nice to have than kind of requirements. Mm -hmm. And then things yeah. like staff training and all that would be really useful, but that can be free. And if you have a look at, say, our site, NCSC, lots of other places offer kind of information guides and how to kind of carry out staff training. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Hugo is asking, will advanced business cover multiple users on the same machine? Yes. So um, what we do is we install on the device itself. So it doesn't actually matter with the antivirus who's using the device. Um, it is device, so it integrates into the operating system itself and will scan, regardless of who's using it, um, the files and so forth as they are accessed. So if you do have people logging on and off sometimes just to make sure and keep things protected, we'll do that. The only thing would be then on the backup, making sure you back up all the different users' documents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Uh, we've got another question from John. Um, is it safer to keep non-financial data on a server at our office or cloud, such as Google for nonprofits, which is less likely to be hacked? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I would have said um, not so much for being hacked. Um, On-premise server, I suppose, used to be, um, but everyone's moving more to cloud. Cloud is a lot more safer, I think, nowadays compared to what everyone has. The issue would be for me, if you've got a physical server in your location, be more around a hardware failure. The advantage of putting your information in the cloud is that it's shared, so they often kind of have redundancies. So even if a server in the cloud failed, it would copy and have the data on another one available to you. So from that hardware redundancy, it is as safe in the cloud. It should be with our kind of backup and everything that we do. It's fully encrypted before it's even sent up into the cloud. So it's uh, protected that way. But yeah, from a security point of view, there's kind of merits to both, but I would probably say uh, it's probably safe. You can certainly use the server, but it would probably make sure you have that cloud backup as well. There's just mm -hmm. other thoughts uh, with regards to hardware and so forth, not just <coughs> hacking. Um, mm -hmm. I would imagine uh, most cloud servers are probably harder to hack mm -hmm. as well because they're, mm -hmm. they're held in data centers. You need to go through sophisticated airport-style security <laughs> to get into these places uh, and so forth. So, yeah, nobody's going to be able to walk in like they could perhaps do into um, your, your charity premises. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Leah Barton. Pretty much of all our documents is on Google Drive. Is this secure enough or do I need to back it up elsewhere as well? I have enforced a 2FA and a three-word passport for everyone that has access to the drive. 
Now, before you answer this, I would just want to um, add in also sort of question from Ruth that's on the same um, topic of passwords. And Ruth is saying, are passwords of 16 plus random characters more secure than three word passwords? Because she's hearing conflicting advice on this. Yep. What we are really stating with passwords is uh, it's very difficult to tell. Three random words, I think, is a lot easier. What tends to happen with the 16 random is nobody will remember it. And then there's the the chance that people will write it down or have a copy of that elsewhere because people just can't remember that. Three random words, people will likely remember and so forth don't need to write it down. So from that point of view, I can see that the three random words works better. As for, it's great that you follow that practice. Brilliant. Well done. Uh, you know, that's that's a great start, being able to make sure that people are, you know, that secure in your passwords. As for where your data is stored, Google Drive is, is fine. To say you can control access to who can access that Google Drive. And it is safe. It's all in an encrypted state and so forth there. Um, we do offer backup solutions that you can back up from cloud to what could be cloud. Um, but really, you're probably in a good place, uh, to be fair. All your key information, it's off-premise. It's um, an encrypted state, so nobody can actually just access it. And you're following good practice guides to get through there. So, yeah, well done. And hopefully more people can learn from doing things like that. Mm, yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, a question from Karen Robin. Uh, is Google Chrome a sufficient password manager? Um, unfortunately not, no. <laughs> um, if you actually look at the Google password, uh, Google Chrome password manager, it, it doesn't uh, <clears throat> encrypt the passwords the same as like a proper password manager can do. So if somebody did infiltrate your, your device, they can quite easily go into Chrome and actually find your password. So whilst they're handy, yeah, they're also a bit of a, a common area that cyber criminals will then access to get more information such as other passwords. So I would recommend a password manager not using something within the browser. Mm. Good recommendation. Um, a question from Carl. Can you automatically back up on-site server data to the cloud? Does this require software? It does require software. And what we'll probably say is making sure you, depending on how you kind of back it up. Um, but yeah, I would certainly get it going to that. I mean, if you look at some of the devices, you get it with your own, such as um, with Apple, you get a certain amount of storage and that backs up your, your photos and stuff. Um, it's just doing that very similarly uh, with what you know is your important charity documents and so forth. But yeah, it will require a piece of software on the device to to kind of identify the, uh, as it were, the, the software what the files rather, uh, and then to send it to the location. So it will be that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Tracy. Um, I have a laptop supplied by church. It's a registered charity. I work yeah. part-time at home, so there's no physical office. With everything saved on Google Drive, using my own Wi-Fi, should I be worried in keeping information on Google Drive? Is it a good or a bad idea? So, yeah, we're back to the Google. The Google Drive is fine. And as long as you're accessing it from within your home network, fine. As long as you don't kind of have any other kind of devices um, accessing your device. Uh, from a security standpoint, I think the data is safe. It's more just checking your device. What you could do is if you had a VPN enabled on your laptop, that would make sure that even if there was somebody else trying to get onto your device somehow through hijacking into your home Wi-Fi network, they wouldn't be able to intercept the traffic and 
with what you're working on uh, in Google Cloud. So that's probably the only thing I would uh, say there. Okay, so just, just following on with that, because I've had a question um, direct. Um, do I need antivirus on my Mac or mobile devices? Yes, unfortunately so. Um, I did do a session um, cool, it's a little bit ago um, where I went through some threats that we've seen uh, on Mac operating systems. I think there was a common thing that, um, you know, you don't need it. There's certainly a number of threats we can see on that uh, decoded website you'll see some of the information silver sparrow springs to mind um of mac specific threats mm. there are there they're probably just not as prevalent because in the order it always seems to be microsoft and windows with it having the bar biggest base that tends to be targeted but yes android yet yeah, um you know non-certified applications and so forth uh through are available there but yeah I would look at it for all devices. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. A lot of the, a lot of um, whether you're using us or anywhere, they often put together kind of small business packages which will cover you for, you know, um, mobile as well as mm. desktops and so forth. Anyway. Mm. Okay, thank you. So uh, another question from Laurie: Can you recommend any free um, trials for your products? So really a supplementary question uh, to add to this is to, for minimum requirements for a small charity, what products would you ideally recommend for full protection? So certainly from us, I would recommend uh, that's offered through the charity digital would be to look at the antivirus and the patch management to cover both. That would cover really the kind of threats that we see coming through vulnerabilities, viruses, ransomware, those sorts of things. Um, and the, that's certainly what I would recommend of our products. And as Lance has now stated and has recorded, <laughs> that we will offer a trial of those so that you can see uh, on that. Uh, of course, we offer there's online help, but there's other assistance we can always do to help make sure that it's working and being effective uh, that you need. But that, there's certainly two that I would kind of put. I think a lot of people just focus on the antivirus. Uh, to me, the patch manager now is probably as important as antivirus. So it probably, I certainly do both. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. So another question from Nick Scott. Um, we have some of our files stored on OneDrive within our MS <clears throat> on Microsoft 365 environment, also accessible through MS Teams. I, is this secure in your view? I would probably say that this is a question for everybody, isn't it? Yes, yes. I mean, Teams, whether, you, well, whether you're saving your uh, information in Google or whether you're saving it in Microsoft because you get an allowance when you, you kind of subscribe to Google Apps uh, Office uh, and so forth. Um, as I said, it is a cloud infrastructure that you're doing it. Um, there are ways that you can sort of further secure it. But to be honest, it's already kind of in a, a sort of state, encrypted state. It's just making sure of the access you grant. So what you've got to think of is probably more allowing through. So the data is going to be secure. It's just making sure that you don't open it up to people that you don't need or could further compromise it. Because if you think if you add it to somebody else, if they've got a weak password or their password's been compromised, mm. they can then access it. So the physical data, it's more the access that is kind of needs to be controlled mm. with all these okay. kind of web things and so forth. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, we've got a question from um, Narisa. Are you aware of a password manager that can be viewed centrally by um, an admin? There are some, yes. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of any, but there are a number online that do have that, that you can kind of create a, as it were, master, uh, and then you can allocate to different users um, what passwords you make available because chances are they don't need to access all of them like you do. So, 
yes, there are some. What I'll do is that's an interesting point. Um, we'll follow up on that. Mm. that okay. Uh, we'll follow up on that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's good. We we will follow up on that. It's not something we offer, but I know there's there's kind of uh, products out there that offer that. Um, because it does get very complex if you're needing to kind of allow people access. And it's like, rather than sharing passwords or making them too easy, you want to control who has basically access to what. So, yeah, no, I'll look into that. Great question. Great. Great question. Okay, another question from Kerry. Would you say um, Microsoft Cloud Storage and OneDrive, etc., are better than using Z Drive for people working from home and needing to access files? Um. So yes, this is where we go back to having your, your data stored in the cloud or on a physical server. Z Drive normally refers to where you would kind of access uh, on your work or a server or device um, shared on a network. So that would be a physical device in your charity and so forth. Again, the data, it's probably, um, you've got kind of physical access, but you'll not get to the cloud. But um depending again it's all controlling the access uh but it's really kind of whether it's in your premise or the cloud um and i would say it's probably slightly more secure um in the cloud um providing you kind of control the access than physical on the server um it's because on the server they can often uh identify your external ip address they know where the server is and so forth but um, so yes, that that's what I would say is it is more secure now to keep things in the cloud than on a, a shared drive from a server. Right. Thank you. Um, yep, we've just got a um, three more questions and then we're going to yep. wrap up. Um, the time has flown by. <laughs> so a question about the better time scale um, to change password in general. I think we would all like to know that. Um. <laughs> What they're saying, yeah, there's been huge, there's kind of conflicting arguments between that about changing passwords or making them more complex. I think what it boils down to is just so that you can remember them and not writing it down. If you change it too often, again, it's much the same as doing something which is a random 16-digit password. If you're writing that down, then you're kind of compromising that password. And so being able to kind of, you know, keep that three world or as complex as you can remember um, would be useful uh, rather than that. But that that's kind of the, the difficulty. Whilst changing passwords is certainly something businesses do, um, yeah, what happens is you can often then just get down the path where it's, I forgot my password and then, gradually start using the same password and adding a one at the end or something like that. So yeah, it's um I probably got to quite go for a strong one and then you know maybe once a year or something change it um like that rather than changing it all too often. Just because I think people are tempted to kind of write it down. So it's kind of mm. finding a balance of something that you could kind of do without it making it too difficult for yourself. I think we all fall into that trap, don't we? <laughs> so we have another question on software. With a charity network, do we need to buy one program that will cover all connected devices or do we need to buy software for each device on the network? So typically software such as we have is done per device. So if you've got multiple people using the device, uh, as we discussed earlier, we'll protect that device. So it's just knowing how many devices you have. Um, some other vendors do that in, in a kind of bundle, but you can get up to say, I don't know, five, 10 devices. Um, we tend to just do it in numbers of however many you need. Um, so if you've got four, six, seven computers, you buy that many licenses and that covers the um, devices okay great thank you and let's just go to our very last question do cloud environments run their own av products 
Most of them should do. Uh, we do uh, actually partner. So as part of the Gen Digital family that I work with, you may have heard of a, a, an antivirus company, Avira. They actually work with a number of these uh, to offer, as it were, almost a cloud um, scanning service. So as people upload information to them, it carries out a scan. Um, we So we do partner with people like that, but also you know, Microsoft and so forth have their own antiviruses and will be scanning on those servers as well as information is uploaded because they don't want their servers compromised by you uploading a virus. So, so yes, it's all checked. We partner with that. We work with in tandem with that uh, and so forth as well. Okay. Okay, great. That's interesting. Thank you so much. We've run out of time. Thank you, Lance and Paul, for this great session. There has been so many takeaways. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we would also appreciate if you could share your feedback on this webinar. That would be amazing. Um, there, there's a link in the chat, or there will be soon. And you will also receive a prompt when you leave um, this Zoom. Just to flag up, just in the last couple of seconds, um, we've got our next webinar on the 26th of October, how to market. And also it's not too late to sign up for the charity digital fundraising um, summit uh, on the 1st and 2nd of November. See your website for more. So thank you very much. Thank you um, for joining us. And we hope that we will see you all very soon. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye. Thank you.